Well, hi, everyone, and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. You know, one of my policies is, is that I no longer go on flat earth debate shows and debate flat earthers because many times it's kind of like trying to play chess with pigeons. They don't understand the rules. They just make a mess of the board, and then when they leave, they just uh, brag to their friends that they kicked your butt. I do, however, stop by occasionally just for my own personal amusement, and this is one such example. Here we have Quantum Eraser and his buddies talking to a globe earther about the difference between the geometric and the apparent horizon. Now they seem to be quite confused in that they think that if we don't see the geometric horizon, it does not exist. And one of the things that they brought up was the measurement of the radius of the Earth by Al Biruni. So today I thought that I would try and clear up this confusion that they seem to have in the flat earth community between the geometric and the apparent horizon, and we'll have a quick look at the Al Biruni method of measuring the radius of the earth. Then we'll have a look at some sources of error for this measurement, both in the measurement itself and due to refraction and other factors. The thing that I'm really curious about is how much of a difference will refraction make and how much of a difference will the difference between the geometric and the apparent horizon make. So let's cue up the music and we'll get going. It should be fun. Well, this channel has the very mature name of Ball Busters and it's run by a gentleman by the name of Quantum Eraser who claims to be a biblical fundamentalist and a Christian, yet has a very abusive style of interviewing and presentation. So I'm going to let him talk about the method Al Biruni real quick, and then we'll sit down and see if we can clear up some of his misconceptions. He measured the dip angle. Yeah, he's a dip, all right. Using an astrolabe, and he applied to the law of signs formula. He also made use of algebra in this calculation. Let's take a look at this, right? This is it. This is what he did. I got some questions here. Yeah, I'm just gonna make it a quick death. Let's take a look at this. So A is the highest point of the mountain, A. B, lowest point of the mountain, B. H, height of the mountain, H. C, the lowest point of the true horizon visible from point A. The true horizon, you mean the imaginary horizon? No, this is the geometric horizon, folks, because to get the Earth's radius, which is, which is based on geometry, then you have to use the geometric horizon for crying out loud. You can't get a geometric horizon from a refracted horizon. You can't get a geometric radius from a refracted horizon. That's it. I don't have to say anymore. It's the kill shot. Now let's explore a couple of things here. First of all is the logic and attitude of Quantum Eraser. Clearly, Quantum Eraser is a very aggressive and very abusive host when he makes his presentation. And the way that he treats people that come on his show could only be described as not very Christian. But let's go ahead and look at a couple of good points that he raises. First of all, this is indeed the method Al Biruni. And indeed, yes, we do have an issue with refraction. Now, here's where Quantum Eraser makes his error. Now, the geometric horizon is a point perpendicular to the radius of the sphere where your eye level meets the edge of the horizon. Now, the reason that this doesn't work very well on our Earth is that we have an atmosphere. And as a result, we have atmospheric refraction. This means that our apparent horizon to our eyes is some eight or 10% beyond the geometric horizon because of the refraction bending the light around the curve of the earth a little bit. Now, he does raise one very good point and one very foolish point. Now, the good point that he raises is that due to the fact there is refraction and this method is based on the geometric horizon, there is going to be a source of error. Let's see how much that error would actually be. The second is because we cannot see the geometric horizon, the geometric horizon does not exist, which is simply not true. For example, in their famous black swan photograph, we see 
two oil rigs off the coast of California. But do we see the physical oil rigs? Of course not. We see light reflected off of those oil rigs registering on our retinas or our cameras. We don't actually see the oil rig itself. But in order to have that reflected light, there has to be a physical object there. So even though we don't see the actual physical object, it has to be present for us to see light reflected off of the physical object, if you follow me. Likewise, we have to have a geometric horizon or we wouldn't have an apparent horizon just past it. You can't be just past something that doesn't exist. So let's go ahead and look at the method al first. Now we know from basic geometry that the sum of the internal angles of a triangle, a two-dimensional triangle, equal 180 degrees. A right angle is 90 degrees. So the sum of these other two angles has to equal 90 degrees as well, but we don't know what they are. But there's another interesting thing that we notice about this drawing, and that is that this is a right angle. Now, by measuring the dip to the horizon from our observation point, which is angle alpha here, we know that this angle is that 90 degrees minus angle alpha. So we have angle alpha right here, and we also have angle alpha down here. That gives us a triangle that we can measure. We know that this distance right here is the radius of the Earth. We know that this distance is the radius of the Earth plus the height of the mountain. Using a little trigonometry, we can use those values to find the value of R. Now there's two parts to the method al -Biruni. The first part is to measure the height of the mountain. The second part is to use the drop to the horizon to calculate the radius of the Earth. Now, in all honesty, this is really not that difficult of a concept, and the mathematics behind it are not that challenging and actually a little fun when you see them come together. If you would like me to go through all of the mathematics of the method al -Biruni, I will, and I'll do that in another video. Just leave me a comment and ask me to do it, and I'll do it. It should just be a 10 or 15 minute video. If not, I have a very interesting video I've already done on it uh, featuring the main surveyor. And we're gonna go over his data real quick now to show that this method actually works to give us an accurate radius of the Earth. Now here's just a recap of the method. As you see, we have two parallel lines here. We have a right triangle drawn between them. This is a right angle here. We have a drop angle. That's angle alpha. Angle beta is 90 degrees minus angle alpha. And due to the fact the internal angles of a triangle are 180 degrees, this is also angle alpha down here. Now, if you look at the next explanation, here's the method al -Biruni graphically. So we have that right angle right here. We have angle alpha, angle alpha. And this is the radius plus the height of the mountain and the radius of the Earth over here. Now what the main surveyor did was he went out to a benchmark, which is placed by the U.S. Geological Survey on a prominent point, and it is surveyed in to its exact location and elevation above mean sea level. So he set up his transit on top of that so that he literally had a benchmark from which to make his measurements. And then he measured the horizon. And he did it five times looking for the drop in the horizon, which is the amount that is past 90 degrees. And as you can see right down here, the average of those five measurements was 90 degrees, nine minutes and 35.4 seconds. Then he went through the method al -Biruni, which is the radius of the earth equals the height times the cosine alpha over one minus the cosine of alpha. He plugged in his elevation, which was 77.4 came up with a radius of the Earth of 3,772.27 miles, and the accepted radius of the Earth is 3,959 miles. Now this is less than a 5% error, which is not bad for one observation. 
Combine this with a thousand observations from different spots on the world and average them out and you're going to become closer and closer to that accepted value. But you're still gonna be off a little bit because we're not taking into account refraction. So let's go over to Walter Bisson's Advanced Earth Curve Calculator and get an idea as to how much refraction will change this value of R. So let's come up here and let's go to five meters of elevation. I get yelled at all the time for using imperial measurements, so we're gonna make it a point to use metric on this one. So our observer height will be five meters. We're gonna put in zero for refraction. This will give us the geometric horizon. And our target distance will be 50,000 meters away and it'll be 10 meters high. Now, if we go down here, we see the distance to the horizon from our eye is 7,981.86 meters. And the dip angle would be 0 0.071.7825. Now, let's see how that changes if we put in standard refraction. So as you see now, the horizon is 8,764.3 meters away. And the dip angle is also a little bit different, 0 0.065-3741 degrees. So let's go ahead and make a little table of this. And that's what I did here. Now I'm going to pop out real quick so we can go over these numbers. Now right here we have our 5 meter observation height. Here's the reference to the horizon with no refraction. And here's the horizon with refraction. And as you can see, it's about 9.8% greater with refraction. Here's our dip angle with no refraction. And our dip angle with refraction. Here's the radius of the Earth with no refraction. And here's the radius of the Earth with refraction. And I did that for 5 meters, 50 meters, and 500 meters. It should be noted that Al Biruni did this at about 475 meters, and the main surveyor did it at less than 30 meters. Now let's see what kind of error rate this gives us. Now recall that the main surveyor did it on one day and took five readings. Now, whether or not there was standard refraction on that day, I don't know. That's why in science you do many, many measurements before you actually come up with a value that you can have some confidence in. But he didn't do too badly with it, coming within about 5.5% of the radius of the Earth on his five measurements. But let's see how we do with this one. Now let's go over a couple of quick things on this table. The difference between the apparent horizon and the geometric horizon is about 9.8% at 5 meters. Notice it starts going down a little bit the higher you go, and by the time you get up to 50 kilometers, they're almost exactly the same. Now the reason that this happens is the higher you go, the less difference the refraction makes in the actual distance to the horizon. And when you get up 50 kilometers above the surface of the Earth, the geometric and the apparent horizon are almost in the same place to your eye. Now let's have a look at the dip angles. For both the no refraction and the refraction, notice it starts off at a very, very tiny little angle. And as you go higher, it goes up by a factor of 100. Now let's apply the Al Biruni formula to these dip angles. Now recall that my program uses cosine and radians. And the way that you convert degrees to radians is you divide the number of degrees by 57. Now that's not the exact number, but I just used 57 to kind of round it a little bit. Now with no refraction at five meters, I got 6,305,395 meters for the radius of the Earth. With refraction, I got 7,602,178. Now if you look right down here, the difference is about 20.57%. Now here's a couple of things that you should notice. In all cases, the radius with refraction is larger than the radius without the refraction, and that goes all the way down the line, including 50 kilometers, although again, they're coming very close. If you look at a percentage of the apparent horizon versus the geometric horizon, 
you'll see it starts off about 20% longer. That number continues to go down, and by the time you get up to about 50 kilometers, it's almost exactly the same. There's only a 0.02% difference. When the atmosphere refracts your line of sight, it goes into a curve, and that curve has an approximate radius of seven over six times the radius of the Earth. So let's go ahead and correct for that. So we'll take our 120.57%, which is our apparent horizon, divided by our geometric horizon, and we'll multiply that by six and divide it by seven. That gives us an R value 3.34% greater than the actual R value. Now, while this rule of thumb holds pretty well up to any reasonable height, say 500 meters, the reason for this is as you get up to about 50 kilometers, your geometric and your apparent horizon appear to be at about the same dip angle to your eye. They're very, very close, and the error rate is extremely small due to refraction. It's very significant when you're much lower in altitude, say five to 500 meters, because that's the part of the atmosphere where all the refraction occurs. So the bottom line is this. The folks over in the flat earth like to point out the fact that we see the apparent horizon. And because we see the apparent horizon, but not the geometric horizon, for some reason the geometric horizon doesn't exist. Well, that's no more true than the fact that the oil rigs off the California coast do not exist because we don't see the physical image of those oil rigs. We only see the reflected light of the oil rigs. The purpose of this video was to show that we can look at sources of error in our measurements. For example, the main surveyor used professional surveying equipment, which is extremely accurate and managed to peg the radius of the Earth within about 5.5%. Now, if you look at a sextant, it's accurate to about 1 one-hundredth of a degree. If you look at an astrolab, as Al Biruni used, you're looking at an accuracy of probably no more than a quarter of a degree. So the fact that he got as accurate a reading as he did based on hundreds of measurements is amazing. And demonstrates why you don't just take one measurement and call it good. Now, the main surveyor only checked one day. We don't know exactly what the refraction was that day, but chances are it was not exactly 7 over 6 standard refraction. If we did that same reading on 100 days with a clear horizon, we'd have a much better result. But we only did one day with five readings and still got within 5.5% of the actual radius of the Earth. When is good enough good enough? For example, one of the other things that the Flat Earth likes to talk about is the difference between Einstein and Newton. For building bridges and firing bullets and doing everything in our daily life, Newtonian mechanics is perfectly accurate enough. We only need the fine-tuning that Einstein gives us if we are dealing with very specific circumstances such as very fast or very massive objects. In the meantime, airplanes fly just fine with Newtonian mechanics. This is an important approach to science. You have to decide what level of error you're willing to accept. To be quite frank, just looking at the drop to a horizon, three, three and a half, five percent accuracy when it comes to the radius of the Earth is actually quite good and quite satisfactory for what we're doing. If this was a formal survey, we'd have to do a little bit better than that, and we'd also have to check it by other means. Now, checking by other means is an important thing to think about, too. This is only one way to find the radius of the Earth. We can look at the method of Eratosthenes and find the circumference of the Earth and get a radius from that. How do the two compare? We can look at great circle courses. That requires knowing the radius of the Earth. We can measure the distance of a great circle course and back calculate what the radius of the Earth should be. Does it match up with the first two equations? If they all match up, chances are we're pretty close to what the actual radius of the Earth is. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you again for stopping by, and I hope you found this helpful. Remember, if you would like me to go through all the math of the method al -Biruni, I will. It's actually a little fun, but it's probably... Uh, 10 or 15 minute video that's very math heavy.
I'll do it if you'd like me, though.